Hello, and welcome back to the Product Launch Podcast. As always, I'm the host, Sean Boyce, CEO and founder of Next Step. I'd like to welcome my guest and friend to the show today, Chelsea Craig from Rhino Reviews. So Chelsea is the founder of Rhino Reviews, and they work with businesses to protect their online reputation by growing and leveraging their online customer reviews. They offer the only fully managed review generation and reputation management program on the market. Every client receives a unique strategy based on their current reputation, where they wish to go, and the headwinds they might encounter. They work to improve both the external as well as the internal reputation and take businesses from a reactive to a proactive position. Hello, Chelsea. How are you? And thanks for being on the show. Hey, Sean. Um, I am doing very well and excited to be here today and have the opportunity to talk with you. Agreed. Well, thanks for being here. We're excited to talk about our topic and learn more about Rhino Reviews. If you will, kind of before we dive into that topic, please give for our listeners a little bit more background about yourself and how Rhino Reviews came to be. Yeah, I'd love to. Thank you. Um, so uh, yeah, my name is Chelsea. I started Rhino Reviews um, about two and a half years ago. Previous to this, um, I was actually working for Frito-Lay um, in a sales role. So uh, I'm also a chip connoisseur. If anyone has any questions about types of potato chips they, they would like. Um, at that point in time, I was looking to kind of take a, my own kind of first uh, professional pivot and was actually going back to school for my MBA. Um, started helping out a couple friends, um, fellow entrepreneurs with their businesses and a weird coincidence happened where three businesses that I was friend, um, acquaintances with received reputation and online review issues within the exact same week. Um, so I started just trying to find a solution in order to help them and ended up realizing while there were tools out there, I thought there was misalignment in the market between the tools that were provided, what they, the you know, what they were charging for those businesses, as well as who they were marketing to. Um, and I thought there was an opportunity to really explore providing a solution for these businesses based off of what they were specifically looking for and the, the needs that I was hearing from them. Um, from there, Rhino Reviews has, has kind of spiraled and, you know, two and a half later, here, two and a half years later, here we are. Um, I ended up not going for my MBA and I'm getting instead the, the life MBA of an entrepreneur. So it's been a very fun ride. Um, and uh, excited to, you know, excited for where we've come and excited to continue to see where we go. Very cool. Thank you for providing. I always love it when a story develops organically, you know, based on your life experience, you found some opportunities or challenges, and then you experimented from there. It's always cool to kind of learn about people's background. And one of the unrelated but important questions I have for you is what's your favorite kind of potato chip? Oh, that is... Um, one that's so to me that's equivalent of asking someone you know what's your favorite movie that's the hardest question um <laughs> the one that immediately jumps would be a tostito lime um i've been on a guac kick lately and uh yeah if you haven't tried that it adds a it's amazing um awesome yeah. i'll take a closer look at that combination i like it all right awesome so thanks for providing the background about yourself and rhino reviews how it came to be and to kind of introduce the topic that we wanted to talk about today, it was all it was going to all be about embracing the pivot, right? So depending upon your experience, right, results may vary. You may or may not have a very different reaction to the concept of pivoting a business, whether it's service or product-based, you know, software or service. Um, and kind of my experience has been such that people should be much more willing to embrace the pivot. It shouldn't be this scary word that everyone's afraid of. And your story with Rhino Reviews has kind of a successful experience with embracing this concept of a pivot. You know, it may not be that uh, hard of a pivot, maybe a softer pivot. So there's different varieties of them, different levels of severity. But regardless, uh, to me, a pivot is all about kind of learning from your experience and then just improving or really getting better over time. So I want to kind of demystify that a little bit. And we want to hear from you what the story of Rhino Reviews was with regard to this so that we can get a little bit more context and learn from someone who's done it rather successfully. So if you will, kind of give us a little bit more background there in terms of uh, Rhino Reviews uh, history and how it kind of has evolved over time as you've learned. Yeah, I appreciate that. And we're definitely uh, continuing to hopefully reach those successes, but I appreciate the compliments. Um, Slight disclaimer to our audience. I am very familiar with the word pivot, um, slight background. I was actually a, a college basketball player. So pivoting is, you know, that was, that might have led into my comfortability around, <laughs> around the subject. Um, and maybe that's what helped me kind of embrace it a little bit more in business. Um, but a, a word that uh, I'm well familiar with. Um, so when we talk specifically in regards to Rhino reviews, um, from a company standpoint, we really had to large pivots, and I'm sure we'll have more in the business as we continue to evolve, but two pivots that really 
um, I would credit to saving the business. Um, one saved it and then one allowed it to kind of achieve the quote unquote success that, that we're chasing right now. Um, when, as a newer entrepreneur, as a business, you know, someone who was creating a business, I had the typical wrote the business plan, thought I knew what my customers would want and would need, and then started selling and didn't really understand why people weren't jumping at this amazing opportunity. Um, what ended up happening was our first product was a transactional experience. We were only selling a, a true kind of software. We weren't providing the managed piece with it. While we had some success with, with reaching our clients with that, we weren't getting the scalability that we were really going after. Um, we started listening to our clients, looking for more feedback, and really just looking at some of the numbers and the data. I got professional kind of support from a business coach who helped me after one year look back and say, okay, let's look at the story of your clients. And we found that um, almost 75% of them weren't correctly using the tools and everything that we were providing. So he challenged, he said, have you asked your clients what they're looking for? Have you gone to them to find out more? And, and we hadn't. So it, it literally just started with that, a conversation, um, you know, speaking to our customers, asking why they weren't doing things, what they were looking for, what they wish our tools provided. And from there, we, we made our first pivot. We changed from just being a software provider to a managed solution provider. Um, that from there, um, within one month, our business, our business really took off. In that following month with offering the managed service, we were actually able to, we had more revenue than we had had the entire first year in business um, because we were actually providing something that our, our clients were looking for. So that, that was a, a large first pivot and a, a lesson learned on, you know, you might think you know what people want, but until you directly get that feedback from your customers and you do that true market research, um, you're kind of shooting blind. Um, so that was the, the first large pivot that we took. Such a great oh. story. And the way that you did it, I particularly like, right? It seems, it, looking back, it always seems so obvious, right? It's like, why didn't we just do that before? <laughs> That's <laughs> typically every founder and CEO's experience with having made changes that ultimately turned out to be successful. But the strategy is solid, right? In terms of like, conduct the customer, what it sounds like, I'm, refer I'm kind of summarizing, so correct me if I'm wrong here, or if you agree, in that go back to the customer, measure their experience with where we started, how we started experimenting, and then see where the opportunity is to improve. Now, in this case, it sounds like you made the decision ultimately to go from less of a software solution to more of a managed service solution. But regardless, that was what was a better fit for the customer anyway. And because of it, you experienced greater success for both the customer and for Rhino. Correct, yeah, and as, as we mentioned at the beginning, there's there's definitely different levels of pivot. That pivoting, that was kind of a softer pivot because we're still providing the same tools, we're just adding a service to it. So I think that as a intro shift for the business was a little bit easier to stomach um, as well as we talk about these kind of drastic shifts. Um, the next pivot that we had that was kind of the more drastic shift was, okay, we've changed our service and we've changed what we're selling. Um, we also drastically changed, I forgot to mention that we also drastically changed the price point. Um, we went from a monthly subscription-based service um, to a monthly, uh, the managed service in itself, one month was ended up being more than what um, the entire full year was. So personally, as we're selling, that I think that was harder to stomach than the actual services change because it was just a different type of sale. We were having to sell the, I was having, I had to learn how to sell the value a lot more. Um, I had to learn how I was selling, who I was selling to, the level um, of uh, the professional that I was speaking to was very different. So it also challenged me to grow professionally. Um, I sought, sort, I sought um, training from the Sandler sales training and they were wonderful with really kind of walking me through sales. Um, it sounds so silly, but you know, having a process, having steps that you follow and getting coaching in that um, was, was amazing. Um, I'm still a, a student there today. Um, every Friday I plug in with my class. It's been two years and I, I know I have so much more to learn. Um, but having that structure was, was huge. Yeah. We've talked about this before. I can't advocate enough for resources in terms of advisors or business coaches as you're going through this type of stuff. The way I've thought about it before is, you know, growing up as a kid, I always had coaches, no matter what it was I was doing, whether that be playing sports or in school, I had teachers and now when I'm trying to do the hardest thing I've done yet, which is like start something from nothing in terms of a business, I was trying to like do it all on my own. And 
uh, eventually I realized how silly that was. I started reaching out for help as well too. And I can't say enough good things about um, those resources out there. And Sandler's a great one. Um, yeah, I, could, I couldn't agree. And they're all over, which is wonderful. Um, so after kind of seeing that both success and help from having the sales coaches we just talked about, I then sought after a, an actual business coach um, and um, said, okay, this is the, the go-to-market strategy that we currently have. At that time, it was all 100% outbound through cold calls. Um, I'm not technical, you know, email campaigns and technologically uh, marketing in that world I'm not very gifted in. So I said, what, what do I like doing? I'm comfortable talking with people. So we were, was doing cold calls. Um, about 120 a day was my goal. So needless to say, at the end of the day, I wanted to stare at a blank wall. And uh, I'm sure we could have a whole nother podcast about interesting conversations via cold calls. But <laughs> well, you know, neither here nor there for that right now. Um, but that strategy, uh, the reason I bring that up is the cold calls worked when I was selling a lower cost, kind of very simplistic transactional product. Um, who I was trying to reach now with this monthly managed service at this higher price point is a different audience. I needed a different way in. Um, and so understanding, okay, we've had this product shift. We now also need to go to market change. Um, so I sought the, the help from Matthew Pollard um, to help kind of rediscover who we were as a business. He helped me take a step back and say, okay, what is our, what's our mission statement? And it sounds silly, but having stuff like that laid out really just helped me clarify who we were, what our target audience was, and, and what's the main service that we're providing in our customer's eyes, you know, our, is what we're saying resonating with them. Um, once we figured all of that out, he said, okay, now how are you reaching those individuals? And our go-to-market sh strategy shifted. Um, we completely... I stopped the cold calling and completely shifted to in-person, trying to get people in person. He, we realized that our unique advantage with this managed service was us, uh, you know, us as a sales team, we're not a product, we're a person. We're here and we're gonna be a part of your team. So how are we explaining and showing that to these businesses? We need to, to meet them. Um, if we're gonna be working with them, essentially, we need to build that trust. So we started in-person, um, both, walking up and down into businesses, trying to, to get into the law offices down in Philly, sneakily, you know, with donuts and any way that we could try and get in, um, to attending as many networking events as I could find. Um, and uh, the success that came from that was, you know, it was harder to stomach as a business because I had to understand that there was gonna be a longer lead time with that, that relationships aren't formed the next day. Um, and versus on cold calls, you know, you have the call, you have the sale and you, you keep moving on. These were going to take longer to develop and as a business, we we're gonna to have to sustain for a period of time while we were developing those relationships. But then in the long term, that would be what would get us there. Um, so it took a couple months, uh, we started forming partnerships, getting clients, and then, you know, about, at about six months, we really hit that stride and the business, um, you know, kind of hit that next level. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, it's excellent. I love the, uh, the, the, my takeaway from that as well, too, is you have to be prepared for understanding how your sales and in particular your go-to-market strategy is also going to have to evolve if you ultimately do decide to pivot, right? So you're turning things upside down a little bit. You may have to make subtle adjustments in some areas and significant ones in others, but you need to be aware of you know, what you're preparing yourself for because your assumptions may change uh, given the nature of your pivot. So as you decide to do that, it's all those things to kind of keep in mind. Um, so good examples of all those as well too. Um, can, you, can you talk a little bit more about the, you know, as you ultimately decided where you would wanna go with what you had learned, really what the value, how the value proposition shifted in the, in the, from the perspective of the customer. So with the, how the customer is thinking about what you were previously and you know, the price point and those types of things and, and your sales and go-to-market strategy all plays a role in that. And then afterwards, where it starts to sound like, based on what I'm hearing from you, it's more of like a partner. It's a resource I can go to. It's someone who's invested in that long-term outcome for me as well, too. But anyway, I kind of want to hear that from your perspective. Yeah, and that's, that's a great point, really, to, to, to touch on. Um, so there's, there's kind of two pieces with that. When we talk about the pricing structure, um, I did not understand that we were actually, I think, being our own gatekeeper with pricing. We were so underpriced compared to our competition that I believe now that it was hurting us. I had many people telling me that, but I kept thinking, no, we're trying to help these businesses. You know, I want 
to offer them a low cost solution. That was one of my, my goals. I wanted to provide a, a solution for everyone that everyone could afford, but because we were so significant, I mean, so I used to charge just for a quick example, we would sell it for $50 a month. Our competition was at 300. As you as a business owner, you're immediately suspicious, wondering what's the difference with that product? Um, and it, and it cost us a lot of sales and that was a lesson to learn. Um, so from a, from a pricing structure, that was huge. Just in the eyes of the business, we lost credibility. We lost legitimacy. Um, once we changed what we were offering, we were able to offer more, um, and just a more fully rounded solution for these businesses, I would say, because we had increased the, increased our prices, we weren't operating at such a loss that we had to scramble for, for everything. Um, from the, in regards to the value proposition, when we are talking with clients, um, that's kind of that personally, that's what I love the most. And that's also what I think one of the reasons that the business has been successful. Everyone always says, you know, you have to find what you love, you know, build a, if you're going to build a business, build it around your passion. And my passion is, um, you know, I, I'm an athlete at my core, just as you are. I think that's why I thrive with the business coaches and that type of feedback. But the other thing that I really crave is being a part of a team. I want to feel like I'm contributing something, being a part of a whole, having a mission and a goal that we're going after. And when we were previously selling just this software, that wasn't aligned with, with what my, you know, what my fire is, what works for me. It was this transactional, okay, they purchased it. It's done. I never speak with the client. I have no relationship with them. Um, and that should have been a red flag when, when I was going through. But again, as you mentioned, when you're an entrepreneur, you're not, you, when you're solo, sometimes you can't see these bigger pictures and these immediate red flags. When we pivoted and offered this managed service, I do, we work as an extension of this business. You know, I view, and I hope that they view us as a member of their team. You know, all my clients have my direct cell phone numbers. They can call me at any point in time and speak to me. Um, and we're, we're committed to the long haul. We have goals that we're working towards for their whole marketing department and we're developing those longer term relationships. So we're not only providing more value to these businesses, but we're also, what we're doing is aligned with what our passion, what, what my passion is. Um, and so I think, I hope at least that that comes through also to my clients and it shows, um, and you know, people, they, they, they trust that we're there. We're truly committed and just the energy and everything really comes through. Um, so just also making sure that, that you're aligned with what you're looking for, um, from a value perspective. Agreed. Yeah. I find that to be super helpful and incredibly valuable as well. Awesome. Thank you for that. Um, Next question, kind of where I wanted to go as well also is, can you talk a little bit more about, right, because we've had this conversation before. So it, it, it's along the same lines of kind of embracing the pivot from a philosophical perspective, but it's, I think you've got a great philosophy and a strategy that you figured out that works for Rhino based on our previous conversations with regard to whether or not to add, right, and from a software perspective, you might think of this as adding a feature to your product, but from a managed service perspective, you might think about adding this as an additional service or upsell or whatever. Like, I'm sure the requests come through, right? Clients or customers can be verbose when it comes to ideas in terms of wouldn't this be cool, wouldn't that be cool? But if there's a difference of, you know, really there's a lot of value in being able to filter through the noise there and really find the true value, right? Really separating the want from the need. I think you've got a philosophy here that works well for Rhino, and I'd love to hear you talk about that a little bit more detail with some examples of uh, how you've done it in the past. Of course, yeah. Philosophy sounds sounds very sophisticated with my method. Um, but as you said, clients love to provide feedback, um, and and it's very important to hear what they're asking because there's themes there, and and there are needs um, and and opportunities both for an upsell as well as to just enhance your business. Um, my uh, my philosophy is a you know this very sophisticated method of a running Microsoft Word document, and anytime a client asks me for something, um, whether it be something very simple like, hey, can you post this on Instagram for me? Or could you start taking our Google My Business messages? Whatever the request is, um, I just quick copy and paste it over to this Microsoft Word document. Um, then scrub through it, you know, every two weeks or so just to make sure there's no overlaps and I haven't worded things differently. But essentially, I follow the rule of three. And what I mean by that is if three clients ask me or have a need for a similar service or the exact same service, which is what has ended up happening, we find a way to put that into the business. Um, because if three clients are asking for that separately, 
there's a greater need out there for it and an opportunity for us to continue to evolve as a business, um, especially working in the digital space. Things change so quickly and so fast that we're always looking for ways, you know, how can we continue to stay relevant, continue to add value to our clients um, and continue to be, you know, of service for them. Um, so the best way, you know, we, we learned that from the beginning with the original product pitch or the original product pivot, you know, the best way to, to provide your clients with what they want is ask them, um, hear from them and take their direct feedback. That's a great way to think about it too, because it's relatively simple, right? It's easy to overcomplicate these things, but I, I like the fact that it is simple. Uh, simple and effective can go a long way, especially when you're thinking of a concept like this, right? And adding services can be involved, right? It can be a quite a bit of work. So before you build out the infrastructure to, or the operations to offer that, to know that the demand is truly there and that people would actually pay for it and get value out of it and really need it is can really make or break a decision to kind of expand into a new area. But when you think about it in terms of the rule three or, you know, that philosophy that kind of you use and share with your team, I think it reduces the, the, the mental burden of what it's going to be like, how much work I'm realistically going to have to do if I'm going to add these things. I see a lot of examples where people will add them because either they think it's a good idea or only one customer has mentioned it really in passing. So there isn't a, a lot ton of substance there and it just winds up uh, costing them cycles. So development cycles or they put a lot of time and effort into building infrastructure for these things when in reality, they weren't ready to make a decision like that. Yeah, very, very true. And the most important, I mean, the most important thing that we all have is our time. And as you, as you know, you know, adding a service, marketing that service, um, it's, it's all tons and tons of your time. And so you really want to ensure that you're being fiercely protective of that. And if you're committing to adding something new like that, that it's going to be worth your time and, and come back twofold. I said it better myself. And with that, I will thank you for being here. But before we let you go, I have two more questions for you. The first one is, what resources, if any, would you share with our audience where they can go to learn more about anything we talked about today, Rhino, or anything else that you might recommend for other people like yourself who could use the advice from someone who's been through it before? Um, yeah, as far as resources, I'm an open book. I'd be happy to, to talk with anyone and answer any questions. I also just love connecting. Um, so by all means, can reach out to me directly. The one thing I would say for entrepreneurs that I thought at longer than I should have. And I wish I had embraced it right at the beginning, you know, even before the business really we even launched, um, would be get help, get support, have a coach. I think that for me, I've had three coaches and I'll gladly take more. Um, they've been revolutionary for my business, um, as well as the Sandler sales training. I can't say enough about that. Um, but yeah, those I would business coaches up front first and foremost. Couldn't agree more there as well myself. I told the story already previously, but since I started going down the path of business coaching, I, I can't get out of it. <laughs> and I just <laughs> keep addictive. adding more. <laughs> so, it is. It's super addictive. Uh, whether it's part therapy, part strategy, a little bit of both, it, uh, it really helps. So I'm going to level up that one and the same <laughs> sales training as well, too. I think it's very helpful. Thank you for that. And last question I have for you is who should reach out to you and how can they get in touch? Yeah, we're here to help any any business owners or you know, marketing managers, any any one in business essentially that's concerned or struggling or has questions about both their online reputation as well as online reviews. We've, we've really noticed that if you look at our client base, it's a lot of second and third family generation businesses where they're looking to get online and build that reputation up um, or perhaps um, a business that's struggling with disgruntled employees on Indeed and Glassdoor um, or disgruntled customers who are just venting because people love to vent and have a platform. We're here to help in any way that we can. If you want guidance, um, tools, suggestions, um, anything that we can do, anything we can provide, we're always happy to help. Um, you can learn more just about our kind of like process and how we support businesses through our website, rhino-reviews.com. Um, we frequently put up blogs, really uh, helpful kind of how-tos uh, through our LinkedIn, or just reach out to me directly, chelsea at rhino-reviews.com, and I'd be happy to um, send over any other information. Thanks for sharing that. Chelsea, I'll link to all this stuff in the notes and thank you for being here and sharing your knowledge and experience with both myself and our audience. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Product Launch Podcast powered by Next Step. If you or anyone you know is involved in scaling a B2B SaaS business, please have them reach out to me about becoming a potential guest on our show. They can email me at sean at nextstep.io. That's S-E-A-N at N-X-T-S-T-E-P.io.
This time, we'd like to take a moment to thank the sponsor of our show, Next Step Consulting. Would you like to know what the right next steps are for your B2B SaaS business? Are you trying to grow and scale, but you're stuck? We can help. To find out how Next Step can help your B2B SaaS business achieve its goals, please email me, sean at nextstep.io. That's S-E-A-N at N-X-T-S-T-E-P.io. Thanks, and keep disrupting.